regular viewers will know that I'm very fond of the retro computer. However, I have to admit, I'm not very fond of the retro accessory and a ball mouse just doesn't do it for me anymore. I've been sent something that should alleviate my problems. I'm Andrew Armstrong and welcome to the back office and join me at the teardown bench. I've received this kit from good friend of the channel, Asnavor, and it apparently is an HID 2 AMI Deluxe Kit and I believe the idea of this, it's a human interface device, like mouse, basically, to Amiga. But I think it works with Atari ST as well, although, you know, maybe we have to try it first. And uh, here is a kit of parts, hopefully everything's there, so we're just going to take the PCB off and get going with it. And we have a little map to follow, so without further ado, oh my word, look at the back of this thing, there is stuff all over the board oh no and it's covered in stickiness i'm gonna have to wash this but before i do check it out that's a pretty decent looking board apart from it's covered in adhesive now uh hid to ami deluxe Ugh. by ember heavy industries well we'll see how this Fairs. The first thing we're going to solder is the microcontroller because they're always the most ah, most fussy. And this is an ST, STM. I think that actually it's an STM32. Oh my word! However, there are a lot of bent pins on this. Is that me? Did I just do that? Oh, I hope not. My word. Could I be really that big a Butterfingers with this? What? Look at the damage on the bloody pins. Took a bit of fettling, but it looks half decent now. So we're going to get the board, see where the pin one is. You can see there's the pin one there, pin one there. I'm going to lift it off, pop it down. I'm going to solder this manually, pin by pin, because it's damaged now. So we're going to need to take that little bit of care. And I don't have any solder paste that I can be bothered to get out. So we're just going to use regular wire, regular flux, regular everything. But first, I just want to try to get it down somehow onto this board so I can start aligning things up. Solder one pin on the edge. And I'm going to do the same on the opposite corner till it's all centered, stabilized nicely. So that's looking pretty good. It's sitting nicely. So then I tend to get a little bit of flux, my dirty flux brush, and I will flux all around, cover it in plenty of gel flux. And then I drag solder and drag soldering is a means where you wet the tip of the soldering iron like that and you drag it across the pins. Let's see if that works. Ooh. Not bad at all. Now when you do this, make sure you go in and check for shorts because uh, I've not got my face to the board, but my spidey senses tell me there's a short. There's always a short. If you do drag soldering and you do not get a short, please tell me how you're managing to avoid that. I suspect if you've got a nice type of soldering iron, the right kind of tip, you can probably get a bit more instantaneous success. By the way, don't drag it too heavy though. That's something else because you don't want to bend the pins. Ask me how I managed that before. That's in nicely, so I think I'm going to look at some of these passive. Now capacitors are always fun because they really go in either way. They're not, um, these are just normal capacitors. These are normal capacitors that don't have a polarity. But we do have a bunch of resistors, so I think the 100k resistors are going to be fun. So I'm going to pop them out. The ones that are really a pain, I find personally, are things like LEDs. And what's this thing in five? There's something missing here. Oh. There's a voltage regulator here that's jumped into there. That's fine too. It's just a little 3v3 voltage reg. 
So what you need to do if you're making such a kit, again, tape is very tenacious. And you've got to be careful, look, because that's removed. I'm going to show you, I'll zoom in. Ooh, that's removed the tape. From the top of the tape, there's a film on top of this tape of components. And you can see if you jiggle it around, they'll all jump. So for example, they'll just fall out. And you do not want to lose all your pieces of dust that you've got to put in. And to be fair, though, these are quite large. Um, you can get much smaller surface mount. So we do know where they should be on the board because it said R2, uh, R5, R6, R1, so we're going to consult with this. You could read the numbers off the board potentially, but it's not very clear on the silk screen. So we're going to have a look on this and see where is R5. So it looks like a lot of them are on the back. And R2, where is R2? Hey, R2. The procedure I like to follow is I will tin one leg of the PCB like that and then I'll grab the component and I'll just solder one side in there and I'll push a bit of pressure on the top make sure it's sitting down and then I will solder the other side and you're gonna get lo loads of practice doing this by the time you've done this whole board you'll be well practiced up so I'll flip it over and we'll do another one on the back but we can probably afford to zoom in a little bit and see if we can find where this R5 footprint is it wasn't much of a zoom <laughs> so the top one is the C12 and then immediately underneath it where I'm pointing is the R5 so I'm going to put the little bit of tin on the board like that because it's quite a big blob if I rotate it you'll see I've put quite a big blob should be fine. And then, just like that, and do the other side. Now this PCB, I think, does have a, a manufacturing flaw in that the wires are not tented. So you can see you could easily solder to one of those by mistake, so be very careful. Now we know we need R5, R6, R7, R8, R9, um, and looking at the schematic it's basically all of these and in fact you're going to do the same procedure everywhere on this board you could just while you're in the mood go around and get those so that will save you a bit of time when you come to do all the different capacitors and things and we can just finish getting these resistors in one at a time just pop them in pop 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 if you do have a hot air blower once you're done you could hit it with that put a bit of flux on everything hit it with a hot air blower and all the parts will jiggle and wiggle and jiggle and jiggle till they're in their final happy happy place and once they're in their final happy place you're done aren't you and I've got one which is called tombstoning see if you can spot the one that's tombstoning one, one there it's actually standing on its end We'll get to that. You've got plenty of time to settle these down. So just to show you that, if you hold it up, you see that one right there? It's not sitting flat, so just get in there, give it a little heat. And down it goes. So what I like to do then is flip it around and we'll just solder all these up from the other side feels forever since I've made a board. Now we have a couple of capacitors. These are nice and easy because no matter which way round they flip, they can go in there. Not like the resistors, because the resistors have writing on the top and you kind of want the writing to be on the top, not that it matters. If I've been tired, for example, I have been known not to bother flipping resistors the right way around. I've got a capacitor, the same on the top as it is on the bottom. Transistors are the same sort of deal. You can see them here piled up. They just look again like a different kind of dust. The difference being just choose one handy leg. I've chosen the bottom left corner. That's probably good enough. 
and just be a little bit cautious. Don't apply too much heat to these. These are not passive components like the resistors and capacitors. These could be heat sensitive. So don't malinger or linger. I think malinger is probably the right word there, isn't it? I do use the drop method. If I if my component isn't the right way around, I shall show you. I pick it up and drop it and more often than not, like a piece of toast, it'll land butter side down. Or marmite side up, if you don't like marmite. You can see I've been racing ahead, so I pretty much put on all of the capac capacitors and resistors, but there is this regulator you didn't see me putting on, it was pretty much standard stuff. Pop it on, do one leg, and then run around. It's just got this little bit here, which is a bit of a thermal pad. No gotchas there, just a little bit of extra solder. And I can see here we need a crystal. So there is a crystal oscillator on here. I'm saving the LEDs till last, by the way, because they're awful, and the rest are gonna be relatively fun. So I think we're gonna be okay with these. But this is interesting because it's a through hole. And it's the first through hole we've come to. I kind of wish they put through hole on the LEDs, but, but you know, that's okay. I'm just going to bend these out like that. I'm going to splay them. Sometimes it's not considered good form to, to splay the old legs there, but I don't mind. Most people will not be able to see the difference at all once you've trimmed them down. And I, I say ye, show me if that were splayed or not you will not be able to identify. So that's that. We do have a USB, and I'm just gonna rip it off the paper and show you that. And it's a through hole one, hooray. So that's the USB. And we can pop it that way, the old Berg, the old standard Berg, I do like this USB. It's a really nice footprint, and I use the same actually on the uh, Tari ST USB, although I buy them in massive quantities because you have to get quite a few for that board. And I'm just going to put my finger on the back because I noticed I didn't put it particularly straight. So I'm just going to put a little bit of pressure while I heat these pads just to make sure it's sitting nice and flat and it is now. And then just attack those pins. And soon you will be done. What else? What else? We have a joystick port, well, mouse. And we can pop that in. Like so. Just put it in there straight away. Hit it, hit it with the solder. Again, something else. I think I've got users of these, RetroNets. RetroNet uses something similar. It's a serial port. I can't remember if it's a male or female variant. But again, nice and familiar. What I like to do is flood these. Because this is where all the strength of the port is. So make sure they're nicely flooded. So then that way at least all the insertion and removal forces won't damage it. I'm just thinking though, hmm. Do I need an extension wire? Because this still has these. You might have to unscrew those. You might not want those. In fact, I'm not sure where this will fit in the Atari ST hole. We might have to do a part two of this video. I'm sure we need to figure out how to get the code onto that chip if it's not coded up as well. There's a big little bunch of pin header here. guess we need to split that so three each side three here three here it does look quite handsome now doesn't it, it looks real not too much to worry about on these oh oh what I like to do is when I'm laying stuff out in Eagle I will put a footprint where the holes are slightly offset, the drill holes, and it will hold the thing. I can't remember what they call it. It's it's a self-retaining version of these. This one seems to be doing it, but maybe I've bent the pin slightly, but this one's 
just flopping out. So I'm just going to put it in gently. In fact, it just fell straight through. And you can see it's a different footprint. These are wide pads and these are just little circle ones. So yeah, whatever footprint was this one, it's got the better drill holes and the better everything. I would do that on a later revision of this board. I would consider if I was if I was making this board, I would uh, definitely change that footprint after making a few of them. Okay. I don't know if I've got a little bridge there, but we'll check that. We'll check it after. Ouch! Smoking hot. So I'm gonna have to use a little bit of solder gymnastics here to get this one started so you just get one pin done like that just as soon as you get one pin you're kind of okay because you can hold it from the back heat it up don't heat the pin don't hold the pin that you're heating that's craziness and then just go around get the rest now these are less susceptible to bridging although look at that the first thing i did was bridge bridge them so you want to make sure you clean those best as you go along <laughs> yeah, should clean the board more. Anyway, it's fine. Now, the one I'm worried about is that. So, if you're worried and you're pretty sure you have got a bridge there and you can't clean it, just get your gel flux on there. And your solder braid. And I can see that they are actually connected. <laughs> so no difference. That's perfectly fine for them to be bridged. And the final piece of the puzzle, of course, are the LEDs. And be aware, LEDs have markings on them to show which way round they need to go on the board. So take a bit of care with that. And if there's instructions showing you which way around, pay attention to those. And if there's not, have a look at the data sheets because the data sheets will tell you which way around they should be. And I'm gonna <laughs> didn't leave really too much room to get in there, but there they are, that's it. And definitely do not hold your iron about the LED for too long or you will cook it and it will break. So the only thing left to do is give it a jolly good clean up. And I can see a lot of that sellotape is still on there, that residue of the sellotape. So that would not help in soldering this up. And I think we're gonna call it a day on this one. We're gonna have to do a part two to figure out what's the next stages, how we get that firmware on. Because I don't think that chip comes pre-programmed. I could be wrong. So that's the final job. I don't know what you think, but it looks like it certainly could be a contender and might actually work. As ever, thanks for watching.